y'all are having a honey of a day. Here with me, we have Mr. Brian Higgins. He is the owner of Atlanta's Hometown Honey. Now, let's talk about honey, okay? They make bee pollen, honey candies, lip balms, uh, beeswax candles, honey straws, soaps, you name it, he has it. So, he's gonna take us through the, a day in the life of a beekeeper. Brian is a small business person and he lives in the Kennesaw, Georgia area and this is where his business is. So we want to make sure everyone comes on down, comes on in and you make sure that you buy his honey. Okay, let's go through this. Alright, so the process of this, is, this is actually a beehive and this is where the bees live. This is their home and we don't ever harvest any honey out of here or anything else. We put numbers on the front of them so that we can do a report every time we go out on them. During the spring and summer, we go through every beehive every 10 to 12 days. And then during the fall, you can do about every four to six weeks. Okay. The main thing in the fall is just to make sure disease, pests, and that they got plenty of food. The bees don't freeze to death, the bees starve to death. If they run out of honey, they can't generate the heat to maintain the, the temperature at 92 degrees inside the beehive, and then they, they starve to death, they don't freeze. So how can we prevent the bees from starving? That's one of the jobs of the beekeeper is to go out there and check on them during the winter time every four to six weeks and make sure they have plenty of food. Normally in the south, we run one large beehive and one and one box of honey will usually get the bees through the winter here in the south. Mm. Um, up north, they'll run two large boxes and two boxes of honey. Uh, these weigh 60 pounds, so 120 pounds of honey plus all the honey that's in, in the two large boxes. They use the honey as an insulation around the outside. Is it because in New York, it, uh, up north, it's colder? Correct. We get longer, longer winters, gotcha. exactly. So they need more food. And then, um, so we normally leave one box of honey on for the bees. Uh, the misconception that a lot of people have is do you feed your bees? Well, yeah, do you? Yes, you, you, just like you feed cattle. There's not grass out in the fields when there's a foot of snow out there. You've got to feed your cattle grass. Right. And so um, when you feed bees, if we were to come back to this beehive, let's say the middle of January, and they, they clean this out. It, we, we had a hard December and right. January, and they cleaned all this honey out of here. Then what we would do is we would actually remove this honey box completely up because it's empty, and all it's doing is taking the heat away from the beehive. Um, we're going to put the lid back on it and the, and the um, cover, and then we feed them a two-to-one sugar water. Okay, and and the like bees, a nectar. it's a car, yeah, it's a car, it's a carbohydrate, and that's what the honey is, is a is a carbohydrate that the bees use. Now, it's the nectar from the flowers, but um, so you feed the bees to get them through the winter time, uh, uh, you know, to finish up the last month or so or a few weeks. Then what you do, um, you you don't have any honey boxes on here at all, so there's no chance of any kind of cross contamination or the sugar getting mixed into your honey because you don't have any honey boxes on there. And so then when the bees run through that and the flowers start blooming and then you put your honey boxes, your empty honey boxes back on and then they fill those up with the, the nectar from the flower. Now in the spring, usually um, about the mid of April before the honey starts coming in, the, the blackberries will start blooming. Uh, actually the first thing that blooms is going to be the crocus, your dandelions, and your red maples around here. And the bees will start bringing in the pollen and the pollen is the baby food. And that's what kind of brings them out oh, of their hibernation. Wait a minute. So pollen or baby food, and Correct. it's like the alarm for the bees to come out. Yeah, well, yeah, it's it's kind of a signal for them to, to okay. start generating for the queen to start laying thousands of eggs a day. She can lay up to three thousand eggs eight times their body weight in twenty four hours. Lord, my so, womb just yeah. got hurt. <laughs> Let so, me ask you a question, bro. Yeah. So here's my question. Are the bees, during the process of what you're doing, because I'm sure a lot of people are going to want to know, are the bees harmed at all? No, no, not, not ever. Not, um, we don't ever, because that's one thing you don't want to do is smash bees. If you, if you smash a bee, you're killing either a brother or a sister or the mom, the queen, and then they're really going to get mad and angry at you and sting you. So that's definitely one thing you do not want to do is harm the bees at all. The other thing, if and, and most of the times I wear a pair of blue jeans and a white t-shirt. My employees wear an inspector's jacket. It's a lightweight jacket with a zip-on veil and elastic and everything. And they wear gloves because they just don't like to get stung. But um, if you work slow, you use a smoker. The smoker actually, well first, the white shirt that we wear or the white outfits you, we wear are light colored clothes. We don't ever want to wear dark colored clothes like, um, like brown or black because the bees will mistake them for us as a bear and then they'll fly up and attack us and sting us. 
So we always wear light color. Whenever you work with bees, you're always going to see beekeepers are using light colors. A beige or most, mostly white. Um, possums, raccoons, skunks, all of those are dark colors. And, and the bees, especially the guard bees at the front, are going to say, hey, there's a bear out here. They're going to get into our honey. we got to go check it out. And then more than likely, you're going to get stung. And then, so then we put smoke all over us. The smoke uh, covers up any smells. Toothpaste, uh, shampoos, aftershaves, colognes, laundry soap. The bees have a very, very good sense of smell. They can smell like So we put smoke all over us. And then we smoke the bees at the front entrance, of the, and those are the guard bees, the ones that are actually, right. it's their job to protect the hive for that four day window. Um, so we smoke them, and then we lift up the lid, and we smoke the bees in the inside. And, and we spray smoke all over them and everything. And we let it sit for a minute or two, and then we can come back and work on the bees. By spraying the smoke in the inside of the beehive, what it does, it tricks the bees into thinking there's a forest fire. Our house is filling up full of smoke, we live out in the trees, in the woods or whatever, uh, even though this is not a tree, right. a man-made tree hive. And um, and so then the bees eat lots and lots of honey. They actually gorge themselves full of honey, get really fat and full, makes them tired and sleepy. But it also, their stingers at the very end of their stomach, mm -hmm. and it makes it hard for them to push that muscle and make the stinger come out and sting it. So we don't get stung as much. And so oh. that, the smoker is, is probably the most important safety equipment that we use. Okay. And then the light color close up. It takes, I believe it's six pounds of honey to make one pound of beeswax. And so we want to try to reuse the combs. Yeah. And the bees will clean them off. I mean, they'll clean these off. The other thing that's really interesting, if you notice, we use a white pine. All of our, all of our uh, frames and everything are white pine. But if you notice how they're orange, yeah. the bees collect the propolis. And all this orange gummy substance here all around the top and how all these frames are orange, they coat it in a thin layer of this propolis, and it's one of the strongest natural antibiotics there is. It's secreted from trees and leaves in the summer, usually in August and September, and the bees kind of use it not only to uh, disinfect their entire hive, but also to seal up any cracks and crevices and stuff like that to get ready for wintertime. Um, to hold in the heat and everything. I will water. never complain about bee about pollen anymore. <laughs> ever. We wear the light color clothes and then the smoke that covers up. We're basically a ghost then. I mean right. and to the guard bees and the rest of the bees. I want to talk about bee pollen. Because people don't understand um, what bee pollen is because I take some as well. So can we talk about the benefits of that? Sure, sure. Um, uh, bee pollen is, is, is very, very healthy. Like I said, it, it's the uh, protein that they feed to the baby bees. is It's the highest protein content in any edible food. It has all your vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants. It has all 12 amino acids in it, and it's high in B6 and B12. I was saying earlier for cancer patients, a lot of them take it, and a lot of athletes take it for building muscle. Uh, your can cancer patients are going through chemo and radiation. Um, they're not eating. Their immune system is at zero, and they feel lousy and want to stay in bed and on the couch. Well, the bee pollen in a, in a smoothie in the morning with a little ice and some fresh strawberries or bananas or oranges or apples or something else, grind that up, you're getting your protein, you're getting all your vitamins to help your immune system, you're getting the B6 and 12, which is going to give you energy and get you off the couch and out of the bed and out moving and stuff. And that's another thing that we always tell everybody, if you do bee pollen, you want to do it at breakfast time. You don't want to do it late at night because it, it will keep you up all night. And that's funny because, you know, I have people asking me, Jennifer, like, how are you doing this? You're doing, because I'll, I'll walk in the morning and I'm bouncing off the walls and I think she wants to fire me. <laughs> but what I do is I take the bee pollen. pollen. Yeah. I have it. And trust me, it's from Brian's, okay? And I love it. What are some of the challenges of being a female entrepreneur. I feel like when we started, we started in a unique situation. Um, Brian was in a near fatal motorcycle accident. And at the time, he was in and out of the hospital so much. And I would lost my job because I had two small kids. And I had him in the hospital taking time off so they didn't understand. I was just supposed to be there, so they fired me. Uh, so at that time, I thought, I can't lose our house. Uh, I had a lot of responsibility on me. So I started doing the arts and crafts festivals. And I started out with a couple of molds. And I started making the candles. And my little boy at the time, that was seven years old, I'd drive him out to the bee yards. He'd check on all the, the hives for us. He won Beekeeper of the Year uh, for the state of Georgia at the time, which I was so proud. And um, 
you know, my daughter and my son and I just started going around to some of the stores in Kennesaw. And the first lady was um, Arlene with, uh, Arlene with uh, Bygone Treasures, Bygone and, treasures of, bit of glass, yeah. and she supported Downtown. us and was Pushed very us. heartfelt for me and was our advocate. And so she pushed us, and we started selling it in stores. I started doing arts and crafts festivals. And it was a family affair, and, and we paid for our house payment. We put food on the table. And so then people started taking me as a business owner seriously. I, I mean, I was in the game. So, I mean, 23, almost 23 years later, we're in 160 stores. Wow! You rock! So, yeah, and I couldn't do it without my team. Right, so, right. You know, the what I went important. for digging in the dirt and not giving up, now, you know, we've done it. Where do you see your company going? We hope we, it stays in the family. We, we, we're wanting to purchase a piece of property that one of, was one of our farms up in Emerson. It was a 125 acres with a home and several warehouse buildings on it. Um, you know, any land you buy anywhere is expensive. They wanted five and a half million for the place. It would have been a pl perfect place to set something up. Like a, um, what we were wanting to do is like a farm tours where people could come out mm -hmm. and see the bees. All of them on one property, do tractor rides. Actually set it up with glass where they could see us pouring candles and pouring honey and you know have kids come farm tours and, and, and kind of like a birch pumpkin right. kind of type thing. It's not like that. But why do we got to go to North Georgia when we could have had it here? Right. Here's a question I have to ask. How long have you guys been married? You look like you knew each other since you were 10. 30 years. We yesterday. just hit 30 years. <laughs> 30 years. Yeah. So my question to you is what, I, I want to hear this from you and also from Brian. What is it about Brian that you love? He's my best friend. Brian, what about Kim do you love? I have to say the same thing. She's my best friend. I, I don't do anything, go anywhere without her. You know, I, I don't like going out of town by myself. I don't. She's usually with me all the time. And, and, I'm living life when I'm with him. And the, see, I guess there's a couple there's of secrets. Son. One, be, be honest. Be honest. Don't fight over money. Money, like you said, is going to come and go. You're going to have some years that you're going to be eating cans of beans and, and you know and cornbread and then you might have other years you'll be eating chopped steak and and ribeyes you know and so money's going to go come and go flow.